Good morning friends, my name is Justin. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I play guitar on songs in Nashville and today I want to talk about the home recording rig. And my idea for this video was to show you that you can run a very bare bones setup for tracking guitars at home. Just doing your own recording. You don't need to spend a ton of money. You don't need to um, have loads of options for preamps or microphones. Uh, you don't need to treat your room in a super expensive way. Um, we're going to talk about all of this. I'm going to take you downstairs, show you my cabinet that is in my garage. I'll show you how I mic it up. I'll show you where I place the microphone um, and just, you know, how I get the sound. My basic philosophy is that we should be focusing on the music, not the gear. <laughs> We, are, we already obsess over the guitars that we're using, the pedals, the amps. We obsess over which speaker works best in an amplifier. We swap pickups all over the place. And really, we could be spending that time playing music and coming up with cool parts for our own songs or for the bands that we play guitar in or the artists we work for or the songwriters or the producers or whatever, right? So here's, here's my sound. This is... Um, Basically, my every everyday setup at home is what you're hearing. You're hearing my Analog Outfitter Sarge into a Morgan 112 cabinet in my garage, mic'd up with a Heil PR30, and I'm going to show you all of that. Um, and I'm running one preamp. Uh, it's the same preamp I've had for 10 years now, maybe longer. Yeah, over 10 years. Uh, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> So um, I'm just using my Jeff Sen Strat straight into, uh, I've got a couple pedals on. I've got the Overdrive Boost on, and I've got the Nordland ODRC on. And then I think there's a tiny bit of, yeah, a little bit of spring reverb. Uh, the spring reverb's coming from the Boss FRV 63 spring pedal. So... There you go. Um, let's go to the beginning of my recording signal chain, to the microphone on the cabinet in my garage. So, um, put my guitar down, and I'm going to take you with me this way. All right, here we go. First thing I'm going to do, put my amp on standby. Um, my garage is directly below the room I record in. Oh, man. This room's dark. This is the hallway down to the garage. So, come down here. This is my mud room. This is where my kids get ready for school. That's my hunting pack. My wife wants me to find a different spot for that, so I should probably do that. <laughs> um, here's my garage. I have a very small garage. House was built in 1959, and uh, it is a small one-car garage. Um, I have so much junk in here, just so much junk in here. That actually helps me a little bit in terms of sound because it's like I have diffusers in, on every surface. There aren't any just open parallel surfaces in this room, really. Like the floor to the ceiling is, but I don't, I don't really get flutter echoes, you know? The ceiling is very textured, as you can see. It's like old school plaster. Um, so anyway... <laughs> Here is my ultra professional home recording setup for my cabinet. Um, man, you know, guys like Tim Pierce, I bet they wish they had something like this. Oh, isn't that glorious? Look at it. It's just a cabinet sitting in my garage. That's it. There you go. And I even have some uh, speakers on top of it. That's that's part of the pro sound right there. You know, the more uh, water damage you have on your speaker box, um, the better that that's going to sound. So um, 
you know, and if you have a tub of uh, old pieces of gear that you have meant to try to sell for three years sitting next to it on more speakers with some other cabs that you, uh, you know, it's nice to have the options in theory, but you just never use them. And then an old amp that needs a new speaker next to a stack of uh, tires and wheels. Great. Cool. Ultra Pro, like I said. So um, here's the situation. One thing that I do a little bit intentionally is that I angle this so it's not parallel to the wall behind it. I don't want any sort of like intense reflections coming back and affecting the way that my speaker's vibrating. So I just turn it a little bit and it seems to help. I, I don't notice anything weird in my tracks. Uh, something else I do, you can see the speaker cable coming coming around the back here. I run that through the handle on top of the amp because that's a heavy cable and the speaker jack on the back of my Morgan cab is it's plastic and it just seems like a lot of weight to have hanging on it, okay? So then if you'll notice that cable and my mic cable here, they run through this mess of other stuff up to this little panel. And here I have two microphone inputs on the left side. And then on the right side, I have a speaker cable on the bottom and an instrument cable on the top. Those are the jacks. I have a speaker cable jack on the bottom and an instrument cable jack on the top. So the idea for me running an instrument cable down here was just if I wanted to mic up a combo amp. And, um, you know, you're not supposed to use speaker cable into the front of a combo amp, and you're not supposed to use instrument cable into the back of a speaker cab. So that's why I have one of each. I haven't done that in a really long time. Sometimes I will mic up a Princeton Reverb or my Lazy J as a combo and use the internal Alnico Blue in it. But it's been a while. I basically run everything through this cabinet. And so, um, let's talk about my uh, microphone situation here. I'm running one mic. It's a fairly cheap mic. I looked it up. It's 270 bucks. It's a Heil PR30. It sounds like a better 57 to me, you know? Um, 57s in this town are almost never solely run on guitar cabs. A lot of engineers, where when I go to other studios, they'll pair them with a Royer 121 or some other ribbon mic, and then you are hearing, you know, the guitar player in the chair out in the control room. In in our cans, we're hearing a blend that favors the 57. The Royer is there just to supplement some like low mids and and whatever. Not super low end, because that's going to be carved out anyway most of the time. Um, but here, here's how this is here's how this is mic'd up. So, one thing you'll notice, right on the side of this microphone, it says end fire element. That means this is a unidirectional microphone. It has these big grill grills on the sides, but it is not um, getting sound from multiple directions. It's not an omnidirectional microphone, okay? And so... My my basic setup is having that like right on the grill cloth. Actually, it should be should be a little bit back from the grill. Let's how about that? That that's better. That eases my OCD that it's not actually touching the grill cloth. And so check this out. This is it's hard to see the speaker inside of there, but if I kind of shade it with my hand, there you can see the dust cap. The ET65 speaker has a fairly large dust cap. And generally speaking, you cannot get a bad tone if you place your microphone where that dust cap meets the cone. And I think I'm a little bit outside of the... Well, no, maybe not. I'm right there. Um, I might have moved it a little bit when I took it off the grill cloth. But those minute changes, I just... I like my bass tone so much that kind of anywhere in that general area works for me. And this this is going to be something that's difficult for you to get used to. If if you are used to hearing your tone coming out of an amp that's behind you on the floor, blowing past your knees, this setup, close miking um, a cabinet in, in a studio setting or in a recording setting. <laughs> I'm calling my garage a studio setting. That's funny. Um, 
this this method of hearing it is going to sound weird to you. You know, um, you're going to hear things that you're not used to hearing. You're going to hear things that sound harsh, that, sh that you're used to hearing the room that you're standing in sort of smooth out, you know, because all of your speaker's direct frequencies are blowing past your knees. So you're hearing it interact with the room. In this situation where I've got my mic placed, like there's no room interaction, you know, and I don't have my garage professionally treated. Obviously, it's just I just have so much stuff in it that it acts like <laughs> it acts like diffusers, you know. So I think that's the first hump to get over. Like you got to get used to how your guitar sounds close mic'd, and it's going to be a little bit different. And there's certain speakers that you'll realize I just can't deal with that. I hate the way that sounds. You know, early on, I, I used the Weber um, in my Deluxe Reverb that was supposed to be the most accurate uh, Jensen clone for the Deluxe. Well, that made it... Um, <laughs> that means it has all of the same issues that I didn't like about the original Jensen's, you know. You push it too hard, it starts to fart out. The way it distorts has this, like almost sort of, uh, the way the distortion decays, it decays into this, like a crackle. Man, I couldn't find a spot to put a microphone on that speaker for my ears at all. And, you know, that's not because they build crappy speakers. They build great speakers. It just, it's just too much like an old Jensen for me. <laughs> I don't like, generally don't like old Jensen's, especially in non-tweed fenders okay so we're back up in the studio i'm going to switch back to my other camera okay so if we're creating a shopping list for what you need to buy you should start with a microphone you can get an sm57 it's been used on i don't know how many records probably the most used microphone as far as guitar sounds i mean some old big rock records they were singing into 57s you know and granted, if you put a 57 on your cabinet and run it straight into an interface or into a cheap preamp, that's going to be different than running it into a full channel strip of an old analog console, you know, like an old Neve console or an API or um, the one at Abbey Road, you know. <laughs> the I think that's an EMI console, what they call that. Uh, anyway... So don't expect it to sound exactly the same. Plus, there's been a lot of things done to that track in post. There's been compression and EQ added. The mix engineer's done his or her part as well. So I would, I would start with something... If I had to make a recommendation, I would just start with something like the PR30. It's a good dynamic microphone. It's tough. You're not going to break it when you drop it. You're not going to mess up the element or anything. Um... And it sounds really good. It's like a 57. It's got that dynamic punch to it. But the EQ curve is a little less harsh than a 57 can be, especially if you're not running it into a really nice expensive signal chain, you know, which I'm not doing. So, shopping list. Microphone. XLR cable, you know. Um, I have to use two because I've got a pass-through in my wall. That panel that I showed you downstairs, I have an identical panel um, on the wall behind my desk right here where, where everything runs um, into my the rest of my rig. So the microphone is connected via a mic cable to a preamp. And preamps, I think they're optional, honestly. If you're just starting out and you want to get familiar with gear and then add wherever you see deficiencies, which I think is a smart thing to do, I would suggest going with a, an Apollo Twin. That's what I'm using, an Apollo Twin X. The Twin X has a USB-C cable that it connects to the computer with. Um, it'll come with that. And then it has dual inputs... Okay, there's actually more inputs, but, but as far as mic cables are concerned, you've got two, two microphone inputs, okay? And you can run those direct if you want, line in or mic. Um, basically, the way that I have it set up is I am using a preamp. I have one preamp, 
It's a two-channel preamp uh, made by Chandler called a TG2. Now I'm going to switch back to my phone and show you show you this rig um, a little bit better. Okay, here's my interface. Apollo Twin X. Here's all the cables coming out of it. So basically, this this optical line, um, SPDIF, I guess, is is where my uh, aux box comes in. This white cable, that is the USB-C, the Thunderbolt cable, to my computer. Um, these purple-ended TRS cables go to my multi-track recorder, so you can hear everything that... You get a line-out direct feed of what's going to my monitors, basically. And then these uh, TRS cables, these are monitor out. And the way that my monitors work is they take a male XLR on one end, or on their end. So I have I have TRS to male XLR to run to my monitors. And then these two are my microphone cable inputs from channels one and two of my Chandler TG2. I basically use channel one, or the left side, for acoustic. And uh, I, I run a, um, a condenser mic that requires phantom power. I'll show you that in a minute. So I just turn that on and then I record. And then over here, this is this is the side that goes to my um, whatever that microphone's called, the Heil Pira 30 down in the garage. And I keep everything pretty low uh, when I want to play bass, which is rare, but I use the DI. I push this little button and this becomes a DI input on the front. And then I, I turn the, the gain up a little bit to, to compensate for running a passive bass into it. I just have a Mexican made P bass. So and then my monitors, I've got these, um, these are really, they're prototypes uh, made by a buddy's company. I can't really tell you about them yet because they're not launched. My real set is being made soon. There's the other side. And then over here, I've got, I've got my, my acoustic mic. And this is a Mic Tech C5. I recommend that you get something like this. This is a small diaphragm condenser that requires phantom power. Again, that's the uh, 48 volts. Push that in. You are sending 48 volts to the microphone. Powers the mic through the mic cable. Um, put this a foot back from your neck joint of your guitar, aimed directly at it. Small diaphragm condenser, 12 inches back from the neck joint. You cannot fail. You cannot fail. It will sound good. And you can very subtly you know, make, like, turn the way that you're playing just to make it favor the body of the acoustic or the neck of the acoustic a little bit. Very subtle changes will make, will make um, different results, you know, give you different results. I know a lot of you are probably wondering, like, why don't you use two acoustic mics? Well, most of the acoustic that I do is in a track that has drums, bass, electrics, you know, it's, I don't, I don't need this stereo image, you know, of a mic over my shoulder and one in front or two here that I blend together or anything. I just want a really good, you know, good bass tone on my acoustic with one track that's nice and punchy. And if I want to do a stereo image, then I do two parts and I, you know, strum the same pattern or something and pan them and get that sort of vibe that way, you know? So, from uh, from the mic pre, if you noticed on my preamp, we're, we're going back to our shopping list now. We've got a microphone. We've got a mic cable to get it from the uh, microphone to the mic pre. And then you're going to run out from the pre to the end of your interface. And that's those are almost always XLR on both ends as well. You'll have to check the ends of all the cables you need. That's for certain. And then coming out of your interface, it'll come with a cable that goes to your computer. And you you know, I'm running a MacBook. You know, you can run a Mac Mini, iMac, whatever. You can run a PC. You know, Universal Audio works with PCs. Pro Tools works with PCs. Um, I don't know that you can get Apple's Logic recording software on a PC, but my, I'm getting ahead of myself, but my recommendation is Pro Tools. To recap, 
I'll have this all in the description too. A microphone, some cables, an interface. You could really do that with headphones. Um, add some monitors. Uh, the cheap, small Yamahas actually sound really good for the price point. And I think they're five or 600 bucks. You know, the next piece of the chain, if you really want, would be a uh, mic pre. The Apollo Twin has its own mic pre's internally. I have them set just so dead clean that they don't interact with my TG2 in any negative way. It, it just, it, no appreciable problems at all. I, I think that's a common concern. Like you don't want to run a preamp into preamps, you know, and generally speaking, sure. But if you set the one really clean, it kind of, I, I just don't think it matters. Not in my experience. I've never had any problems. No engineer has said, oh, there's something weird here. Are you running a pre into a pre? No, nobody's ever said anything like that. Nobody's ever said, is this through an aux box? You know, or is this your Rev D20? I was hoping to have a real speaker. Like, no, there's no, again, I give good parts. I give good tone. And those are the concerns, you know, that, that my clients have, right? And um, I print effects to the extent that I think they're not going to interfere with what the engineer is going to do when it's time to mix. And uh, that's it. It's super, like, dangerous, dangerously unprofessional setup, right? <laughs> I have some treatment in this room. These walls were a bit, you know, noisy or whatever. So the, the coffee bags are, those are actually, um, there's, there's 703 insulation behind those and I've got some on the other side as well but there's so much going on here I guess I could have a little cloud here if I was if I were super concerned with how this was sounding but um, this just works for me and it's really simple and it wasn't super expensive and it started out as like here's just going to be my starting point then I'm going to just you know I'm going to expand my mic locker I'll get a lunchbox I'll get a bunch of preamps and it's like uh, just <laughs> I haven't done that, you know? I have tons of amps, I have tons of guitars. I make sure that what's coming out of my speaker sounds really good, and then I capture it, right? That's what this part of the signal chain is. It's capturing your tone. And, you know, yeah, the, the same is true when I play acoustic. I make sure I have a really great acoustic. I make sure I have a loose right hand when I'm playing. Um, I make sure it's in tune. I place the mic aimed at the neck joint. Can't fail you know, in my opinion. Um, and then when I'm playing bass, again, that's rare, but I play a passive P bass and it sounds good. And going into my TG2, it's just capturing it, right? And the TG2 is actually kind of cool. It's got a little bit of grit to it when you turn, turn the gain up and that can be kind of awesome on bass. Um, I still set it fairly clean. Again, I'm not trying to back the engineer into the decisions I've made as far as overdrive levels on bass, effect mix levels, or decay times, or feedback on, on electric guitar. And I'm not trying to back him into using any, like, I almost never use anything on acoustic. It just goes into a TG2. And most people are like, TG2 on acoustic, what are you doing? It sounds good. I think it sounds really good. And my clients don't disagree, you know. Um, if you do forego an external preamp, you should maybe buy like a small bundle of the UA stuff. It sounds pretty decent. Um, I use the distressor on my bass almost always, just a little bit. It sounds like a real distressor. It might not be exact, you know, but it does what I need it to. It, it sort of... Uh, controls the the attack see i don't love compressor on electric but when i'm playing bass it really helps to even out sometimes the attack on a bass particularly if you hit any part of your fingernail on the string it's just it's this huge spike you know and that it just kind of evens some of that out for me you know um i also like the api channel strip on acoustic very rarely I like the Helios um, 69 plug-in. I use that mostly for my vocal mic because 
there's just a lot of excess low mids from having the microphone right here. And when I, when I run my audio out for these videos, I, I EQ my vocal a little bit using that. So you can do a lot with a microphone for an electric, a microphone for an acoustic, and an Apollo Twin, and a computer. Last thing I want to talk about, and I'll let you all go, is Pro Tools. There are so many um, DAWs out there. Uh, this town is a Pro Tools town. For better or worse, we are stuck, you know? And ev like every major studio I work at is running Pro Tools, every single one. There is maybe one producer that I know who runs Cubase. Hi, Brad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And he does awesome with it, you know? He's just, he's like, whatever, I like it. I don't have to pay a subscription. And, you know, he's, a, he's free of Pro Tools. You know, we're all a little bit jealous because he's really free of Pro Tools. Um, I pay the subscription uh, because, you know, it's something I can write off. It's my job. I get all the updates, whatever. The benefit to Pro Tools is that it's ultra intuitive for when you're recording. If you have everything patched properly and it's talking to your interface, um, which is pretty much all automatic at this point, um, it's just so easy to hit record. It's so easy to do the multi-tool select for your cursor, and your cursor changes into different tools depending on what part of the track you're hovering over, whether you're about to do a crossfade or, you know, drag a part of your track out, you know, maybe maybe you punched in on into a track and you want to drag to create the best little crossfade or whatever. Punching in uh, when you're recording a track is ultra intuitive. Bouncing down um, consolidated wave files or just sending your tracks as a new session, it's all super easy. And I have Logic, I've used it. There's There's some people who really like Logic and that's the environment that they work in. For me, Pro Tools just makes a lot of sense. I can fly on Pro Tools. It's it's out of the way. I'm not I'm not using any of my resources in terms of my energy, my focus, my brain power to figure out what's happening in Pro Tools. It's it's just seamlessly in the background and I can focus on the music. That's the important part for me. I hope this was helpful. Check out the description for a bunch of links for the various parts of the signal chain I'm talking about, and they are affiliate links. I will make a tiny bit of money at no extra cost to you if you order through my links. So have a good day. I'll see you later.